Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining our webinar here and how they can expedite the process to meet compliance for the impending deadline. So my name is Chris, I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Acrolinks and today I'm joined by a very special guest from Accenture, Ann Godbold. Ann specializes in non-financial risk management with a focus on regulatory conduct uh, conduct risks and is a supporting a number of clients to implement their journey to meeting compliance with consumer duty. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. So before we get into the content and some summer items here, I would love to ask the audience a quick question just to get a pulse of who is joining us today. So I'd love to ask you in this poll, which department or which leader is ultimately responsible for owning the new consumer duty uh, compliance within your organization and, and implementing these policies? Are we looking at an operations role? Does someone in your product and planning team uh, own that? Is it marketing because of the outbound campaigns? Or is legal and compliance a dedicated team that's focusing on this? Um, or I'd love to know, have new consumer duty focused roles actually been opened in your organizations that people are now, uh, 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 that you're now hiring for? And what I'd love to know too is if we're missing anything in this list, use the uh, chat panel here to just let everyone know where you're from, where you are. Would love to hear uh, where that is. And let's see, wow, we've got a straight, I didn't, next, uh, we have one more poll coming. I'd love to hold it on for an extra couple seconds here, but it looks like we have a straight 50-50 down the line here between product and legal and compliance, which is very interesting, you know, especially with marketing not really being represented here or direct roles of new consumer duty. Not surprised to see since the product teams have to identify what these products are, how they align with those audiences, and of course, legal and compliance, making sure things are of course compliant to meet these new regulations. That's absolutely fantastic to know. Thank you everyone for participating in this. I know this was right out of the gate real quick, but I'd love to move forward here now that we know where consumer duty is being owned. And so before we get straight into the interview here with Ann, we wanted to point out some very interesting or some very interesting information out when we started reviewing the regulations being added for the new consumer duty. And as you all know, this has helped to, to this is to help with desired outcomes for those consumers. Those outcomes really boil down into those four categories: consumer understanding, products and services, customer support, and fair price. And what we've realized is that the majority of these categories, these outcomes, they're all heavily dependent on content and the access to information. Content that is meant to educate customers not only needs to be given to them in a timely manner to make proper decisions, but it also means that they need, they need it written in a way that they are going to be able to understand. Now, when we look at products and services, content must be created to market, position, and attract customers. This content must also properly disclose risks and rules associated with them so customers understand how they use those products effectively. Now, content for those products and services must also be written so that their intended audiences can understand them clearly. More importantly, different products and services are meant for different consumers. The way you message content for traditional banking products is going to be vastly different than the way that you message for investment uh, products, for example. And you need to be clear on which audiences should be using your products and services. And cross-selling between the audiences with different financial goals can be disastrous if consumers are receiving messaging for solutions that are really well above their financial comprehension or even access. And finally, looking at customer support, it's important to make sure that consumers are able to use your products and services and get help when they need to without hurdles. It's just as important to make sure that the content and knowledge areas they're interacting with are written in a clear and consistent tone that they can understand. And by improving that clarity and consistency and scannability, and the inclusiveness of that content, you can provide consumers with answers that they need faster, and you can help deflect calls and tickets out from your support teams. Now, you may be asking, how clear do I need to make my content? And how will I know it's clear for my audience? And how do I measure that? And this is all good news. These are good questions because there's good news later on. We'll be talking about that and we'll be answering a lot of questions related to this as we continue. And you know, before we really get into the QA here, Anne and I, when we were talking earlier, just understanding how consumers and customers need to be spoken to. And you brought up a really good point here, just about expectations with consumer reading levels. I'd love to hear your, your opinions here. 
I am. Um, I actually think the consumer understanding outcome is the most difficult outcome under the consumer duty requirements. And it's difficult because we humans are difficult things. Uh, we've got some research in the FCA, from the FCA in its financial lives uh, survey, which just highlights that actually reading levels aren't where you'd like them to be. But we've got one in seven adults with a reading level of that to a nine to 11 year old. When it's asking you to make sure that you can draft something so that all consumers can understand, that means everyone. And if you're uh, marketing a product to the general public, you need to make sure that you've written for that audience. But it's not even just literacy levels. Like this task is really difficult. Numeracy levels are limited. And um, we've got some research from uh, the OECD that says that the UK has 33% of adults assessed as not financially literate and that we're 15th out of 29 or, uh, in, all, in U European countries in terms of where we sit and to how literate they are. And what that really means is actually people really struggle with percentages in understanding uh, how interest rates work. And therefore, if you're explaining a financial product to them, you need to go back to the basics and draft this in a way that they can understand and are prepared to, to listen to and interact and I wish I wish the complexity started like or finished there and um, we haven't talked about digital exclusion uh, there's some estimates that 7.8 percent of UK adults have either never used the internet or last used it over three months ago and um, how do you manage for those and make sure those people can understand what's going on and then something that I think I can definitely relate to is like I don't always behave how I know I should um I I really want to tell you that I check my bank balance enough, that I am uh, really surveying and looking around for my products before I uh, you know, set, do my ISA for the year. And the thing is, I know that I'm short for short of time, I, I'm not doing it properly. And that's me sitting here as an accountant with 15 years financial uh, compliance uh, guidance, knowing that I don't do that properly. I don't think many people do. And, and these issues can be emotive. If you are in debt and struggling, you don't always want to deal with it. So the idea that you're needing to think about consumer understanding with all of this going on, it is a massive ask. And I also, I was just gonna say, it isn't just me that thinks it's one of the most difficult areas, but there is a survey that says uh, that 33% of decision makers think this area is one of the most difficult areas uh, to focus on consumer duty. And I'll be honest, you know, I'm, I'm 37. I don't even balance my checkbook. I don't think I ever have. So in that same scenario, I'm not paying attention to the finances personally as I need to. And on top of this, you know, one in seven adults here having that reading level of a, of a nine to 11 year old in the US, which is roughly around a, a, a sixth grade reading level, we have results showing that half of the population is at sixth grade or below, which is just interesting to see what kind of levels of clarity across the world need to be met in order to properly communicate with all of your audiences. What I'd love to do now is go right into the Q&A and get into some very deep topics here related to the new consumer duty. So, I mean, just right off the bat, you know, some there, there might be some obvious scenarios here, but I'd love to just get a quick take on some bad examples that led to the creation of this regulation. So, we have a new CEO with the FCA. There's been a lot of critique of the FCA and they needed to respond. And for me, I think it's the new CEO, Nick Arafi, saying, I don't want to write a set of rules uh, that may or may not cover all scenarios. I really want to focus you on what matters outcomes and you work out what's the best way to get there. When Chris came up with this question, I think a big part of you would like me to come up with some really sort of dirty stories of how people have messed up. What's really sad is I actually don't have those. And maybe what's sad is where this is going wrong is, is is more operational like we've done a lot of work in the uk around financial conduct over the last 10 years i really believe that most regulated firms are trying to get this right but it is so difficult even under the clear fair and not misleading rules because of the volume of stuff that you've got to put out there um, and the sca agrees they are actually putting guidance out pretty much every other day at the moment and there's a podcast where they say uh, what they see is one of the biggest challenges, which is 
uh, that firms write really generic communications, probably for operational efficiency. That is not, it's not a soundbite that's sexy, but it is the reality. If you look at uh, one of the biggest fines that we've seen for a communications issue, which was a high street retail bank who were fined 90 million, what they did was um, they, they and I imagine the product changed over time, they had some language in their renewal communications, i.e. not the sale, well not the initial sale, but the renewal, which they might have seen as an in-life transaction, which talked about uh, receiving a competitive price at renewal. And there's also an element where they talked about a discount based on the customer's loyalty, which actually wasn't, wasn't being applied. And I don't believe they did that deliberately. I think what happened was, when they originally designed the comms and the product that existed, but over time, the product changed and they didn't spot in one of their communications, which they probably didn't think of as their prime communication, this change had happened. And it just talks about that operational challenge that you have, because there's a lot of communications that go on. Having them all governed and controlled is really difficult. And then that's not the only challenge um, that you have. Uh, the world is always changing, the products are changing and the expectations are changing. And we see a lot of language now around sustainability, green, ESG elements. That is super confusing. We're all going on a journey to understand what that means. Uh, the SCA has put out a consultation paper around this language. And it's, it's difficult to read, it's quite complex. And it's so interesting when you talk to people about what does this really mean, they understand it in different ways. I actually sit as part of our pension trustee um, for Accenture. And we're looking at how do we uh, change that portfolio um, and really think about sustainability and embed those values. And just getting to terms with what this language means is, is difficult when we are professionals in this space uh, with the time to spend to learn and the, and the best educators coming in. If you are uh, you know, type of time uh, you know, not working in this space, this stuff is, is really difficult to get to grip with. Uh, and I think it's probably one of our next challenges because it does very much link in with this consumer duty on uh, requirements around consumer understanding. And finally, finally, vulnerability. Um, this stuff is uh, this stuff is really hard, and I, I think we probably could find some very specific examples where vulnerable customers have not been considered in the generic communications that are put out there. Um, the SCA is talking about a couple of examples where uh, you know, people haven't been able to see properly and actually the communication text is very small or not been given to them straight away in Braille. Um, but it's also just thinking about, uh, and the, another example from the SCA is are you sort of pushing people to make decisions too fast, particularly when they're vulnerable, not having thought about when you do the communications um, and building that into your journey to give them some time because vulnerable customers have needs that we really need to think about and design for when we're designing good communications. So I guess that hopefully gives you a feel for what some of these, where, where people go wrong and what these challenges are. But I am really conscious, a lot of this is operational, reflecting the fact that you have so much volume here. It really brings a lot of different perspective into where where these faults kind of come in. And in, in the first point, when you were talking about you know just changes to a product as as things adapt over time, you forget how integral it is to make sure that con like it's not about just aligning this product to that audience and then you just that's it. You have to continually monitor as this product grows that it still aligns with that audience and if it falls out of alignment that's it's such a challenge um well, one thing i forgot to mention earlier to the audience though is we are going to be taking questions as well and i would love for you to send them over to us to Anne as well if you use the questions area in that go to webinar control panel you can send questions directly to us and we're going to hit those right at the end of the webinar after we finish this q a so please send us any questions that you have as we continue you. And I was going to go on to the next question in the Q&A, if that sounds good to you. Perfect, thank you. Awesome. So the next question we wanted to come in, so what are the biggest areas of change that firms now need to plan for in order to meet this new consumer duty compliance? So I think particular marketing functions being really focused on sales and new products. And I think they're now taking more, or they will be taking more um, focus on existing customers and that support capability because their ability to draft is exquisite and actually if you put them in some of these more 
uh, like existing pieces, talking about how the product works in life, uh, you uh, are able to bring that skill set and redraft uh, to deliver excellence. I think there is a big piece around how customers understand how to use the product. And we probably haven't focused on that in the past, such as how to make a claim in insurance, how to complain or how to switch. And I think that is something that they're now going to have to take a look at and they haven't before. Um, the big high street banks are really thinking about how to manage the digitally excluded customers. That feels like it feels like something that they really need to think about uh, because that is a big gap and actually a big population of those probably sit within that vulnerable bucket. I, I think one of the biggest changes though is around testing of customer understanding. In the past, you know, we're looking for a, to be able to prove that the message was fair, clear, not misleading. Now we're looking to prove that the customer is able to understand it and make a good decision. And actually that involves a real change in thought process because if you ask someone, do you understand? You know, we all nod and say yes, no one wants to look silly. Um, and it actually doesn't help you demonstrate that they can do it. So what yeah. I'm having to think about is what, what, how do you go about that? Um, do, is it, do you ask them and put in steps to sort of play back so that you can hear that they are uh, able to understand the information that you've imparted or for a complex product um, and able to make a good decision and justify it to you? It's a, it's a really interesting moment. Um, and then I guess the last bit is about action. The FCA wants to see that people are taking action as a result of these communications. Again, we probably have thought about it from that sales perspective. I don't know that we have in, in life. So just trying to make sure that we've applied that um, to those in life and maybe what was typically support capabilities to ensure those communications are delivering for these outcomes. Interesting. So even more than just worrying about which products and solutions will work for which audiences, I mean, it's, it's not just the communications. It's how do people access help? How do they get to your website? Is your website using the proper wording and phrasing going through your navigational items so that everyone can equally and clearly find help topics or access to agents to get questions answered? That's a ton to have to consider in here. I, I think so. I think especially when you think about what do they need in order to, to, to do this and the interlink between other work streams that are going on. There's a lot of dependencies to deliver as well. Absolutely. And so that, then that kind of leads us into our next question here, measurement. How do you measure these customer outcomes? How, are you, how do you prove any of this? How do, you, how do you benchmark and then figure out impact made? So I'd like to put a bit of good news into my messaging, which is last week the SCA uh, sent out a note having reviewed the implementation plans for some of the larger firms that were submitted in October. And there's a couple of areas of good news, and this is one where there, there was some good news. They highlighted that a number of the plans that had been shared had uh, detailed metrics around the consumer understanding outcome. And it talked about one firm noting it would incorporate marketing data and customer behavior into its ongoing uh, monitoring activity. And they also talked about other firms uh, looking to capture uh, going forwards, the percentage of customer facing content being tested and a percentage of customers who take the expected action after communication. And it's how I read that was actually, uh, they're highlighting those items as being really important, uh, giving us a bit more guidance about what is expected so it's clear for us all. Um, and those things feel, feel like good measures to me. Uh, they are, in my opinion, focused on the risks that we see and have been called out. So for example, they've talked about uh, uh, the risk of nudge and sludge, uh, or sorry, the risk of sludge, and they the desire to have more nudge to make people do the right action. Um, so actually being able to demonstrate that people are acting after you send the communication feels, feels good. Um, I think a big piece is that understanding, so the idea that you're able to demonstrate you've tested it and people really do read it in the way that you think they do is great. I we actually do a lot of work and we're doing a lot of work with firms on their data and metrics now and so I also need to be balanced and say that this stuff is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard because the data that you would use to source this is sometimes split over multiple business units, uh, could be multiple brands, multiple legal entities, all leading up to the group entity 
you could uh, really to think about how you display it in an effective way by uh, really thinking about uh, the operating model, so who's got what information, who's going to be exploring it. Uh, and so I guess on a more negative, uh, that does feel right and consistent with what we're seeing, the SCA highlighted uh, actually it didn't always feel that like, uh, firms got enough support on these data elements, on these data, uh, like good data colleagues data um, and prioritising that enough because delivering this, this information for July will be quite difficult. <laughs> Nudge and sludge is the term I, I pulled out of that too, which was an awesome way to kind of put it together. But it is great to hear that firms are now positioning themselves to understand how they're going to measure these outcomes. I'm going to jump right into the next question here. And just a reminder to those to the audience here, we see a couple of questions coming in. Please go ahead and send those directly to us. If we can't get to all of them, we'd love to just uh, post a follow-up to this. So please use that questions area to continue to send questions right in directly to us. So here's a big one, and this is a huge challenge as well. How do these firms identify the groups that are at risk? And then how should they segment them? So what's going on now across most firms is they're reviewing all of their product offerings to make sure that those products are uh, designed to uh, help a real customer need and are delivering a fair value to their customers and as part of that they're really looking at who is the target market for that customer who isn't at that target market so is there anyone that you would exclude what the risks are uh, related to that product and it's that information that we're expecting the colleagues uh, uplifting the content and reviewing the content to really pick up on. So uh, being clear who should, this should be sold to, uh, what harms could happen if they took this product out in order to uplift their, uh, their communications. I need to be really clear, um, the large firms have got a lot of products. Uh, they are very much having to take a risk-based review and that information will therefore filter into the marketing teams in order to do the uplift, probably in drips and drabs, and it's probably very tight for July. Uh, most firms are getting through those high, high risk products now. Uh, probably will have the moderates done for July. And then there'll be a population that goes on post July. Um, and for the marketing, I guess that shifts everything back a little bit more uh, because they need these inputs. But that information is going to be uh, key in order to making sure you're designing that content uh, with that in mind. And they're expected to be able to demonstrate in what you're drafting that you really thought about what could go wrong and how to get that right audience in place. In terms of how they should segment, so I love this question and I love how customer centric you are you are being. Um, I feel like you have grasped what this regulation is all about. I think at the moment most people are heavily focused on compliance um, and because of how our, the data typically sits and where they are with their sort of migrations that probably means they're really product focused and actually being able to get into the custom segments is, is something that will come later um we don't know how the regulator will feel about it but like that's operationally where we are there is a real play to say actually are we going to get to a place where rather than firms being uh, focused on products they're going to be really focused on what the customer need is so what is that customer's financial objective which might might ultimately really change how you how you structure these firms and how you deliver that. So rather than thinking about a loan, uh, you're really thinking about about um, about uh, the, the needs that the customer's got in order to, uh, uh, for example, finance finance a home, finance their car, and thinking about what does that really mean and designing for that. And the thing, as, as you talk about the latter, which which is the bigger challenge, understanding the consumer need and 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 how they're planning on growing. I mean, I would argue that is the best approach to creating actual lifetime value for that customer. Making sure you have someone that is with you year over year um, by segmenting based on their needs as opposed to the products they best align to, um, which is an awesome way to focus on how you segment those customers. And that kind of brings us into the next question. Granted, we may not be there yet. It's more product focused segmentation um, and maybe some demographic information. But when, when you do have a group that you're realizing, um, you know, could, could be risky, how do you quickly kind of figure out which groups are at most risk? Is it based on engagement? Uh, is it based on complaints? You know, what, do you, what do you think firms should be doing? So 
There's a huge focus in the UK around vulnerable customers. I think we think 47% of the population at the moment would sit in this group. Those needs um, for that population vary significantly and where their challenges are that they're facing are really different. But whoever you are, whatever you're doing in financial services right now, you've probably got a strong focus on prioritising them for consumer duty. It's been highlighted by the regulator multiple times that they see gaps. And they sent a letter just the other day to insurers to say, how are you dealing with uh, people in financial difficulty who can no longer afford their protection products? And um, we've seen continued messaging from the regulator around them. And I think firms really need to think about when you are designing your content, how do you help those people in their various scenarios get to the right place? And some of those things could be quite straightforward. Like, like in the examples that we've given earlier, it could just be larger text uh, where they've got site difficulties and really thinking about how you design so that it's got the uh, visual strength so that someone can easily uh, pick up the text. It could be really thinking about how do you write this material so it could be readable by by an by a eight, eight-year-old uh, so that it's inclusive. Really thinking about how you design your graphics. Uh, we're not talking about numbers, so that it's easy for someone to actually understand what that what that could be. Um, and actually thinking across the whole life cycle, how you do this, not just at certain, maybe not just on the sales side, but we haven't have in the past. Yeah, it's a that's a fantastic example too, referring to insurance companies. You know, quite often we see when there is financial trouble, like an impending recession, or trouble in in, in employment markets, insurance policies are typically one of the first that get lapsed, that people don't renew, which leaves folks exposed to an insurmountable amount of risk should a catastrophe happen. Um, I'm going to jump right on to the uh, the next question, which is gap analysis. Uh, firms once they figure out who their segments are, they need to identify where the content that they require for this communication and support for customer service is either missing or is not uh, not good enough, not to the quality to that audience so that it's comprehensible uh, to them or given to them in a timely manner. How, how would you recommend firms should start approaching their gap analysis efforts? So I feel for the marketing team because you're downstream in the activity chain. And so there's an element to think about what can you do now while you're waiting for the product information? And then how do you accelerate when you've got all of the product information? So what we're seeing firms do now is really think about uh, how can they map where the communications happen within the journey? Because we don't always have that content. We haven't always recorded in live communications. And that means it's very difficult uh, when you do get the insight from the product reviews about what the risks are, um, who this is for in order to be able to manage that effectively. So we're seeing a lot of that work going on. We're seeing them really think about how do we uh, how do we build the risk control framework and then the standard procedures templates that sit underneath this in order to make sure that we're able to direct our copywriters in the right place and to write in a consistent fashion and to write to a quality and a governed approach that we can take forwards. We're seeing uh, firms really think about how do we start to build that testing framework because we might not be ready to rewrite just yet, but when we are ready, we want to be able to test those high risk uh, communications. And because it's quite a different way, we need to have a look and, to, and build that. And then uh, where they've got through the product review and they, they're starting to work out what that population of com communications are, they need to prioritise those. That July deadline is, is, super, is super close, uh, particularly for the volume that you can have. And therefore, we suggest really starting to think about the tooling and the analytics in order to prioritise those and to continually prioritise those so as more things come available for you to work on, that you're continually working on the highest risk items so that come July, uh, you can at least be able to tell that narrative of how, you, how and why you've done what you've done and making sure that you uh, have been super focused on uh, preventing the most harm possible. Absolutely. It's, uh, I do want to remind folks again, yeah, we see a couple questions coming in. Please send them in. Use that GoToWebinar control panel. We've got two more questions as part of this Q&A before we get to audience questions. So please go ahead and send those to us. And an absolute great approach here and on figuring out you know, how do we figure out those gaps that are in those products. So of the last two questions, this next one is 
you've really hinted at this throughout the entire Q and A, though. But just more directly, you know, how does content play that role in compliance for the new consumer duty? I so I appreciate I'm a compliance specialist, but I actually think it's more than compliance. I think it's how does how does content deliver value? Because actually, this is one of the key ways that we interact. In fact, for most customers, they might never speak uh, to a colleague on the phone or, or the frequency they do that is so limited. They might go to the branch, never. And actually the materials that you're sending via text, website, uh, email, etc., a letter, are their key contact with you. And therefore, it's, that is the way they interact and they see your firm. And when you draft this well, your ability to help get good outcomes is huge. You have the power to draft something that someone can make a decision to change a product that they're on or to take an action that they wouldn't have taken before that helps them get a good outcome. So actually, I'm super excited about this regulation because this regulation has the power to improve a lot of people's like, health and well-being by delivering good, uh, good financial outcomes to them. And I think it's just being really mindful about how do you design for everyone where the product is offered to everyone? How do you uh, make sure that you've considered these additional needs uh, for people who actually need that? There is some research which talks about, uh, you know, that, that just because a customer is vulnerable doesn't mean that they're going to cost you more or that you're going to lose money for them. Actually, these people uh, that, you know, can be really good at paying back their loans. But if you draft that communication well, what you're doing is empowering them to do that because they understand what's expected from them. And so I'm, I am excited because I think this will help a lot of people. And perhaps for the firm, it will become like their brand and their position to the market and help people understand uh, why that's a good firm to work for, to be part of and to be a customer. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, as you said before, communication, that's if, if the consumer isn't engaging with content proactively, those communications and the content, the way that that's written is really the only way that they're going to understand how to make their decisions with the firms that they work with. Uh, the last question here before we get into a couple of quick topics and, and then the audience questions, of course, is uh, technology. Or, or what kind of technology can firms be using to help meet compliance? Is there, is there anything that, that folks should be considering? I think it's very hard to believe that anyone can manage this effectively on a spreadsheet. The amount of information you need to capture, the volume of communications, where they appear in the chain, uh, the, uh, the ability to show that they've been governed and reviewed, to show the result, results of testing and how that testing uh, has been taken in, into part into the changes. I, I cannot see any firm being able to evidence what they have done without a governance tool. It, 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 it blows my mind that anyone thinks they can manage that on Excel. And Excel has been the tool of choice in the past. And then I think the analytics capability here is phenomenal. The idea that you, you aren't using that in order to prioritise your workbook uh, and in the future in that sort of BAU world in order to monitor what was going on feels like a really big gap. Um, it, these communications are living things. They're touched and edited by lots of different people for lots of different good reasons. But doing this well is really complicated. You have so much language, so much uh, expectations around bringing the science, around behavior economics, around design in order to deliver this well. You need to have a way to control for that. Um, and I therefore think some analytics monitoring capability is going to be essential and we see the leaders starting to re uh, deploy this now in the firm to help control this uh, going forwards. Yeah, it's interesting. Your your comments here actually bring us into a slide I wanted to present real quick, um, just to kind of set an expectation because th this requirement is is new for firms, and this is some information we pulled from one of uh, from from one of our audience uh, from one of our customers, focusing more on technical communications, but. Just to set an idea of the amount of work that is involved with maintaining and updating documentation. Uh, now, granted, again, this is more on technical communications, not as much for firms, but the amount of, of effort that's required, there's an estimation that it was about if you have a technical editor or an editor who's to review and correct content during this gap analysis that needs to be produced, a person can review about five pages critically per hour that gives you about 
200 pages per week. And if you take out, you know, two weeks vacation over here in the US, very short vacations times, but that's about 10,000 documents per year an employee can actually review. Now, if you look at the amount of documents or pages, these pages that need to be reviewed, uh, in these technical areas, they see 50,000, 150, 300,000, sometimes more documents, more pages that actually need to be reviewed. And if you were to break that down based on the amount of staff you'd need, just for 50,000 pages, a quick breakdown here, for five people that would still take a year and at an average editor salary of 50,000 pounds, that is a quarter of a million you know, uh, pounds here. And, and if you have more documentation, just to get these done in a one to two year time span, that's an enormous amount of headcount you would need to review all of these documents, depending on the amount of pages for the paperwork, for the products you have. Um, and keep in mind the average editor rate that we've seen when it comes to uh, professional uh, uh, book editors is about 5%, which is still huge for a, a human driven effort. So this is not something that is very easily taken just by adding more people to, to solve. And one thing I'd love to do right before we get into the Q&A is to ask one final audience question we'd love to ask you. And it is, where are you in your journey for achieving compliance for the new consumer duty? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'd love to know uh, if we can post that up here, fantastic. Are you still identifying your population for your communications? Are you actually journey, uh, mapping the journey through those communications, how people are reacting and using the, the, the content that you are sending out? Have you started doing your risk assessment for where the gaps are in, in the content and communications in your products? Are you already measuring and scoring that content to understand which pieces meet those certain quality levels? Um, or have you already started creating or updating content that to, to plug those gaps that are in those experiences that your consumers can face? Would love to know uh, if you have an idea roughly where you are in the journey. Um, it'd just be great to get a good pulse check to see how confident or unconfident people are feeling about the progress that they're making for the new consumer duty. Love to give you maybe 10 more, yeah, this is perfect. Let's take a look at these polls here. I'd love to see what results we've seen. Wow, people are really far along here and that's fantastic. I mean, we kind of have to be because we're at a position now where July is right around the corner. Uh, so measuring and scoring that content and create, which is interesting that looks, this is a multi checklist here that we can have in here, but awesome to see that folks are working in and measuring that content and creating and adapting those gaps in those content. So everyone, thank you so much for uh, participating here in the, in the poll here. I'm going to just jump forward here. We are at the end here. We're going to take Q&A. I just want to uh, give a quick blurb out, you know, for who we are here at Acrolinks. I appreciate everyone joining this webinar, but just so you know who we are, Acrolinks will improve the impact of your enterprise content. And within Acrolinks, we capture the details of your business writing goals, such as desired clarity levels, tone of voice, style, preferred words and phrases, inclusive language, and more. And we guide your writers to meet those goals. We do that by analyzing and scoring all of your content and providing recommendations and suggestions directly to the writer to better align that content to those business goals. And that's ensuring that it's relevant and ready to drive engagement. And then Acrylix also adds more science to the art of content creation by understanding the qualitative characteristics of your content and providing actionable feedback to your writers. Writers receive these recommendations as they write their content or edit it in the interfaces that they're used to, making sure that it's aligning with your firm's guidelines. And this improves your content workflow by allowing your writers and editors to spend more time creating content as opposed to reviewing and factoring in mechanical feedback. And additionally, this process can also be automated. You know, should, uh, should you have a content repository, we can help with prioritizing which content pieces should be addressed first. And this creates powerful quality gates that stop bad content from being published. And then finally, we help compare the content quality against the performance of that content to understand how well it aligned it or how well aligned it is to that audience. And to make sure that you find those poorly written pieces of content and prioritize them for improvement. And it also reveals how well those improvements you're making are actually changing the performance and the outcomes for that audience. 
So I, I know we're here at the end of the webinar. I'm taking a look. We have a handful of questions that are in here, so I really appreciate everyone sticking around in this. The, the first question that came in, how can we start segmenting our audiences? Should we segment by product need or by demographic? Actually, this was a good question, but we it looks like it came in before we actually had that. We had that built into our Q&A. So that was a great question that we actually already had addressed. Um, so I appreciate that one. We covered that. The next one is, do you think the new consumer duty deadline will be pushed? Ooh, is that a little bit of insider? I don't know. I, I can't say inside information, but well, I don't know. Um, Any opinions? What do you think? Do you think it might get pushed? No, definitely not. <laughs> I think what we all think is going to happen is we're going to get more guidance about what this really means and see a continual drive of improvement of standards in the UK. Um, I'm just going to quote the blog, uh, it's a podcast that came out from the SCA, which is, it said, this isn't a one and done. It's not about preparing for July and then leaving it. It's about setting in place ongoing arrangements. So I think this is going to be something that we're talking about for a long time. Very, not surprised that. So that kind of it solidifies it in stone. It's going to be something that's not going away and we're going to have to keep working for it. Uh, and it actually, it sort of ties into this next question that came in. Have you heard any insights on whether this type of regulation could spread to other countries? I mean, that's actually, you know, so many firms work in multiple areas, multiple locales. Have you heard anything about this type of regulation spreading into other areas? So, we like to think in the UK that we lead the world in regulation and conduct regulation in the past we have. So when we first came up with conduct, we saw that spread to the UK, Hong Kong, Australia and take very similar measures afterwards and even update the rule books. So I, I haven't heard anything yet. I'm sure the world is looking to see how this works. Um, and maybe in six months time, we'll see something coming out uh, from those sort of locations going forwards. It looks like we have one last question here. So if you do have any others, please go ahead and send them in as I read this last one here and we can hang on and help address any more. But the last question is I, I work. So the question is, I work in, in business banking in the digital space. Is there any direction on key areas of focus for SMEs? I believe that might be subject matter experts in online banking. I'm, uh, uh, I think of, it's an more, for SMEs. more medium entities, I think. I know. Um, so, so I was going to step back, which is... Small medium entities has been something in the last few years that we've had a lot of, or some firms had a lot of focus on because um, we maybe in the past viewed them as more like a commercial customer and we didn't necessarily give them the protection they needed. And actually, it's not like you're dealing with an expert FD in some cases. You know, these are small, medium businesses. It can be like the shop around the corner type entity. They're not necessarily sophisticated buyers. Uh, the consumer duty requirements are based on product. So if they are deemed a retail customer for that product, they are retail, they, you need to ensure that they are considered in these requirements and therefore make sure you're drafting with that audience in place. Um, it's not, yeah, like I know a number of firms have done a lot of work in this space, but if I looked at the sort of patchwork, or sorry, if I looked at where I felt like we, the maturity was in terms of conduct regulation across the UK. But there's some spaces where we've got, we're really mature in how we implement it and how we deliver it. And I think I'd be really confident that most firms would get that right every time. If I looked at small medium entities and how we manage that, it's probably one of the areas that, despite all this work, is, is less mature. And so it's a, a big area of focus for uplift now. Um, I think it'd probably be one of those areas where people are prioritising. Uh, I don't want to talk too generally, but yeah, prioritising for communication review, having not done that uh, in the past, and making sure it's written in a way that is delivering those outcomes. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. Small, medium entities. I apologize for that. So this this was the last question we got in. I, I'd love to say thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. It was absolutely awesome to have you here. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found it insightful. And I'd also love to thank Anne. Thank you so much for coming in here. It was awesome to hear your insights. Uh, this is a lot of very interesting stuff going on here. And the timeline is approaching. So again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Good luck with this. Thank you very much. All right, that's it. Everyone have a fantastic week. Take care.